Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Property Hustle Show. Have you ever thought about private lending, but not necessarily from the perspective of lending on properties for acquisition? Have you ever thought about lending onto projects, lending out for things that real estate investors will do with real estate, like renovations, house flipping, whatever that's needed? If you can fund it, would you do it? Well, today, Ping is having a conversation with Diana Lizarazzo, who is the founder of the REI Fam. It is a great platform that helps real estate investors get connected to open transparency for private lending for matters such as what we just discussed. Diana has a lot of experience in real estate and she has been doing private lending herself, specifically onto projects where real estate investors need a little extra money to complete a project and see it through. She has a lot of great insight as to what you need to consider if you want to do private lending onto projects and also how to make sure that you're well protected and insulated. I'm sure you're gonna find a lot of value in this conversation. As always, reach out to us if you have any questions. What have you been working on lately? So lately I've been working, actually, I feel like you can see it right here. My application has been like my baby a lot this year. And to help me even just get into this, so it's my social networking platform that I've created for real estate investors. But to even give me the time to do that, I am also obviously doing private lending to be able to give me the time to put the focus on my application and spread the word about it. Okay, so what's this application about? And what's, uh, what's your vision about this platform? So basically, the vision is to help investors to be able to build trust, build credibility within the communities, and also to become searchable. Like that, as you get into the investing world, I feel like you've probably seen this too, where you get in and trying to find people that you know, like and trust. You know, it's hard when there's no proper portfolio, no proper profiles that you can actually have things, no searchability. You know, if you go and be like, hey, who are all the people? For example, people, a lot of people are going into the US, right? Like if you say like, hey, or who are all the people in Austin that are doing flipping? Can you find that? You know, like none of these capabilities exist. And, it's, and so like there's these kinds of things where I started noticing and my background was in developing application or not applications but developing processes for companies right. and then it's just my problem side of me started coming back where it's just like i could help the investing world and in, in like better ways you know help us be better at finding the right people for us or being better efficient in like finding people and also being able to share who we are more and be able to show you know like yes this is what i do this is the kind of projects i work on this is what i'm up to these days so just having something that's like more like profile oriented and i mean still having the social aspect to it but just like something where you can actually really get to know people or get to know their character even for example on a project to me when you're working on a property you can really tell a person's character on how they solve the problems yeah. right even in my show that's one of the reasons why i have this show re behind the scenes is because you really get to learn about a person, right? Their character, who they are, what kind of problems did you encounter and how did you solve them, right? By reading that, either we learn from it, you can go through and you're like, wow, I never want to do that again. Like do the problems that they've done. Like I, I rather learn from their mistakes, right? right? Or you're just like, oh, wow, I love the way they solve those problems. I never thought of that. And I would want to work with them. Right? right. So can you kind of walk me through the difference between this application versus usually an investor's uh, social media platform? Because sometimes we do post our project right we talk about the, the ROI for example right how much money that we raised and how much profit that we actually made or what type of mistakes we we had encountered throughout this process what's the difference between posting on like IG Facebook versus posting on your application one of the things is for example like let's say you post on Facebook Instagram anywhere it gets lost in the feed right once you post it it goes somewhere else into the ether within time right wouldn't it be amazing if you have a section on the properties you've worked on right and you can actually look at them and they look it looks like mls i could even share my screen if you want to see but it looks like an mls listing you show your property show the details you actually get a section in there where you can talk about the problem so it's like you go for example to my profile and then you can see that oh you know okay great you can give her reviews so if you've worked with her as a partner or as 
or as like if you've done coaching, whatever way you can give reviews, you have their profile to get to learn more about them. And then you can see the properties and be like, oh, what properties has she worked on? Or is she currently working on? Or yeah. is she wholesaling? Right? right? Like it shows you everything, whatever you want to show in there. Like if you're a wholesaler, you can just post these are the properties that I'm looking to assign. You know, if you want to show historical data, you can be like, here, look at the projects I've worked on. So if you can get to know who I am and like what my philosophy is, what my values are, right? Or I can be like, hey, check out the project as it is. And I'm doing a, a raise. I'm raising funds. Like check out what the details of this project is. And you can decide for yourself. Is it something you want to be involved in? You want to invest in whatever, right? So, so it's so pretty much like a business profile only for real estate investors. Yeah, like I would say like a LinkedIn. <laughs> as if instead of being a resume, it's like your profile and portfolio. And you can give your self-reviews and get yeah. I mean not give yourself get reviews obviously yeah basically just a, a platform where people can connect on that specific issue or specific property and then people can give out a bit of opinions here and there how many members have joined so far I started in September and we're at 120 now Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yes. <laughs> My mission is to get to 2000. So I feel like I'm still behind. I'm still pushing hard. So get oh. as many people in. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But here's the thing though, that people are usually with the, this type of social media platform, uh, like in terms of the growth, right? Usually it goes this way and then you start like mm -hmm. uh, going up quite a bit. So yeah, sometimes we got to be a little bit patient with, uh, with the growth yes. of uh, the membership. So another question that, that you mentioned, another question I have, because you mentioned about Austin, does this just, um, are you promoting in the Ontario only or this is going to be in North America? So right now I'm just focusing on the communities that I'm in and, and sharing it with people that follow me or in the communities that I'm a part of. But my big vision is that it's like a worldwide thing. Like I would love it that like that, like you can be going anywhere be like what the hell's going on in Costa Rica what type of investments are good there and seeing what what kind of people are there and what type of investments they do like my big picture is that everyone's in there right because people can bring in their communities because it's like I said like a LinkedIn right like you have a community or you have even maybe just not maybe like a mentorship community but you have people and you're all in the place like imagine where you're just around all different types of investors all different types of mentors all different types of professionals that are related to the real estate investing industry and you can actually search by all those different things like who are the mentors in in texas like you're going to a new place like let's say we're talking about costa rica imagine if you can be like hey who are all the mentors professionals and investors that are in flipping in costa rica right like how much better would that be where you can actually see all this yeah no, yeah, I, I like I like the idea of a filtering out a bunch of people that's not relevant, right? So that you can stay hyper focused on the right, I guess, a power team or even like the uh, right people in that specific location. And mm -hmm. also on top of that, if you get to see their portfolio, what they've worked on, right? It kind of breached that trust and, and credibility or even the transparency between the investors because that is the biggest problem today, so especially in real estate field. A lot of people try to flex as much as they can, right? Nobody really care. I think the people do pay a lot of attention to how much you showcase and obviously the truth behind everything that you talk about when there's a collaboration opportunity but people seem to start trying to take into different route where they they kind of use that to brag instead of trying to create more more trust and transparency yeah i i love the idea of behind this platform for anybody who wanted to join this platform though uh is there a link that they, people can click on or yeah, yeah, for sure. So you can go to real estate investor fam. So F A M, real estate yep. investor fam dot com. Okay. And you can go there and it's really cool. You can register for free. And then if you want to get a membership that gives you more capabilities, then you can get a membership and it's super cheap. Actually, the membership goes up in two weeks, I believe. Right now it's 168 a year and you get all these different capabilities that are there. And we have now the app version for Android and the Apple. Wow. Uh, so you did, you did putting a lot of work to build, to build this then. Yeah. This. So, so you can also, you just go, but the, you go on the website and right there, you can, it tells you like how to, inst uh, like just to install it from the website. I see. Okay. So. You mentioned that your this year's focus, or since last year, you've been 
kind of shifting your main strategy into private lending. Can we talk quickly about that? Like what type of projects you were lending? Because obviously the real estate market took a different turn. Flip or burr, burr becomes like extremely difficult to actually execute, right? To actually get that full amount of the capital plus renovation back. So the full burr is no longer there anymore. So how do you actually pick up your project, your operators, and uh, and what type of uh, capital are you actually lending out? Yeah, for sure. So on the private lens, I can say I've actually, I would say I'm, I've always been majorly pri- on the private lending side, just because when I'm my active stuff, I don't do as many, like I'm usually doing one, maybe two at the same time, but really, and whereas private lending, you know, I'll have many more going on at the same time. And obviously, because it's private lending, so I can do that. But and I can we can definitely talk about because I think you're alluding to like the differences, the changes. And I can even tell you the changes I've seen in so many different years coming up to now. So, you know, starting in COVID, burrs and flips were the things to like to be a part of. And that was like easy to find. You find good burrs, good flips in, let's say, the beginning of COVID. I would see actually more burrs were happening just because there are more benefits at that time. Yeah. In the middle of that and then going into the next two years, I would say majority of my stuff was flips that I was lending to. And even on my side, I actually switched on the active side. I was very burr. Like I was all about just getting as many properties under my belt as I could. And even the same thing happened on my side, the active side. I was also flipping because just the numbers were just way too amazing to ignore, right? And then in the burrs, they were not, you know, the perfect burrs anymore. You're having to leave some money in the deal. And in my sense, at least, like in a business sense, I need to be getting my money back because I need to be growing and not losing money not losing it but you know getting money stuck in the deal because I couldn't do things so for me it was also a very strategic move talking on the active side but you would see the same thing on the private lending side a lot of the deals that were coming to me were a lot of flips because they were just really good deals going on right and then when interest so last year when the interest rates went up really high in that January to March time frame I had private lends all over the place I had one do in that time frame, I had a couple that were overdue and I had others that were just starting, not just starting, but still in the middle. Mm-hmm. I can tell you 90% of my money came back. Everyone went and took advantage of that up. Everyone sold. So even the ones that were delayed, they hustled, I guess, to get it done for that amazing market. That's the like- ones that bought and realized that the market was just like worth it to put it on the market, they ended up close like lots of people closed earlier than their expected time frames. Mm-hmm. And that one that was supposed to come on time came on time. So I was actually very, very cash heavy from March to probably middle of the summer. And I I was not finding any deals. It was like crickets until probably April where finally things started coming in. And that was in the time when interest were going up, you know, people didn't know what was going on. So it was very hard to do deals because you didn't know how the mortgages were coming at that time. And people didn't know what was happening with the interest rate. So both those things, you could see they were a factor. Right. And then in the summer, then I started seeing deals coming back again. And now it had changed completely. So now it went to something to be done, like a one month renovation and then get it refinanced and so buy and hold and so I did a few of those and then I flipped like that no flips and we're going on by the time all my money came back so like that in around March I think everything was back uh, or like that like 90% like like I felt like 98% like I had way too much money in my bank account <laughs> yeah no but honestly the cash cash is king though when uh when the markets are kind of sort of like in a declining market right because when it's healthy market you, having the money in your bank is kind of like losing to the inflation. But the moment that the market is going down, you want to actually push that cash reserve as high as possible so that mm-hmm. when the opportunity comes, you can actually take the advantage of that. Right. So I don't necessarily always agree with the cash flow is king over mm-hmm. cash uh, timing for cash flow play versus a uh, cash play. 100%. Right? Completely yeah. agree. So now the question for you is how did you even get that money, uh, all that capital back when the interest rates start going up? Because I would imagine a lot of projects couldn't get wrapped up. Or was it because No, last year they got wrapped up like that. They all sold. These were all sold sells or refinances. I see. And this is how you can tell the experienced investors from the non-experienced, right? Is like that, like people saw what was happening and they went into go mode 
right? They were just like hustle mode. Let's get these on the market. Either like that, like some, I don't even think they barely started the renovations. And I think the up was just so much. I think it was more of a let's test it out. Let's put it on the market. And let's see if we make the margins we want for such a quick, like we sell it. If not, then you continue the process, right? I'm assuming, right? I didn't really ask, but I just thought like a lot of money came back. And it was just the people I invest with are also, you know, advanced investors where they know what they're doing. They're keeping an eye on the market. So I just want to clarify. So the timeline was from 2021 to 2022, I'm assuming, right? Because from 2022 to 2023 is a, in a declining market. I think a lot of people had issue uh, wrapping the, the projects up. 2022, the beginning was that huge high, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that was, was the big up. So I'm talking about that very, very small margin, January to like March. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Very small time like that. All my money came back like in the span of three months. It was just like all of a sudden I get calls from my lawyers. Oh, this came back. This came back. I need to know how much money is owed back to you. And I was like, what? I'm like, one was supposed to come back. And all of a sudden, I think I had like five or six of them come back at the same time. That's awesome. It's the same span of the three to four months, like February to like March. Yeah, yeah. it was just the beginning. That uptime is when everything started coming back. Like, so I'm saying like these people were seeing what was happening and just saw the opportunity to either refinance or to sell. Right. Awesome. Have you thought about investing bigger portfolio? So it sounds like a private lending, you're looking for that kind of a short term project, right? In and out through flip or through bird. Have you thought about investing into a multifamily building or so commercial building where it might actually be held for, let's say, three to five years. In some cases, it will be 10 years. I don't have enough money to do that. So I've never thought of it. I, I mean, I have this not true. Because I have lent to buildings like 14 unit buildings and stuff. I guess it's just been what's come to me. And the ones that have come to me are usually that six month to one year duration, right? Like if I were to do something more longer term, I would just need to like, it's all in the due diligence part, right? I wouldn't mind doing something longer term, but the benefits need to be there to do them, right? So for me, we just like that what matters is, I mean, what matters in doing mortgages, right? I do the exact same thing that banks and, and mortgage institutions do, right? I'm always getting proof of funds, for example, to make sure that they can withstand whatever it is that they're planning to do. My expectations are that you're able to withhold a project and do what it is that you need to do within your expected time frame. So I would be applying the same thing for a long term as you would like for, for burrs. I guess small burr would be the same for a big burr, right? It's just you're working in a bigger scale. So if you're telling me, like I would ask, for example, your renovation quote and pictures, right, of the property, which is even if I would say if anything more than what banks probably do. But I would actually look at the property because I have a background. My husband has a renovation business. business. We understand how it is to quote projects, I can look at a project and I can see if it's an actual viable renovation, if their quote makes sense, right? And that becomes very critical because there's with me, it's always about a win win. Like I've had actually investors where I've told them, I'm just like, that quote looks a little shy. I'm like, I'm buffering this much for your quote. And I'm like, you should probably do the same. And I run my numbers even to my numbers like that. I had one person where I think they were they, to me, they, I felt like they were shy, like $30,000. $30, I'm like, I need to see that you have, for example, if the quote was like, let's say 50, I feel like I need to see you have cash $80,000 plus, let's say your holding costs to say, right. And then I would just tell them like, I'm like, you know, just take a look at these things. I think it's going to cost you more. So even I, I like to advise my, the people that come with me because if I see something, I rather let you know, like, hey, I know renovations. So if I see something that I'm like, this looks like it's not considering this or that, I tell them for the fact of them knowing, but also so they understand why I'm maybe now saying like, okay, you said your budget's 50K, but for me, it's looking more like 80K. And right. I'm making sure my numbers still run, their numbers still run at 80K, let's say, with everything else. Yeah. By the way, Diana, I love your business model, actually, because uh, you're talking about flip and bird. That's actually something that you're extremely familiar with, right? You don't actually need to be private lending into a project that you don't necessarily understand. You can just yeah. invest in something that you know already. Right? Exactly. Yeah, and also a lot of investors, when they're trying to pitch the deals, they always try to run down the renovation budget. Like all the expenses, they try to run down and they run up the uh, new appraised value or ARB and all that stuff, right? I usually do the other way around. I want to make sure that my investors understand that 
my, I'm running up with all the expense, potential expense. That could be renovation budget, that could be carrying costs, that could be even mortgage payment, the penalties and all that stuff. If I'm all running up those numbers, right, and it still comes down to to be a profitable position, like enough profit for all, for all parties, then we know we can actually pull the trigger on that one. So it's, yeah. actually, really, it's actually really nice that you're in that position to be able to advise uh, the operator, the active investors that they need to actually increase their budget a little bit. Yeah, I completely, because a lot of people love to do the, best case scenarios yeah or it's also sometimes there's some people that in this case this person wasn't i wasn't sure i sometimes also i'm just overly conservative i'm looking out for them too um mm -hmm. because they weren't this it's not as if this person was an experience but sometimes also with inexperienced people you know for example like they don't get the right right, right? Their quote, if you don't know enough about how contractors do their quotes, they could give you like a base number and you don't realize that there's a lot of additional things that need to be added on to it, right? There's so many different reasons that can put you in a really bad situation, right? And yeah. so to me, it's like that. It's like, I want to make sure it's a win-win. I'm going to obviously be investing in projects that I know will be successful, but also because I want you to win too. You know, I want, and, and if I see there's like a little bit of information that you need to know just to make sure you're successful like that, like I want everyone to win in a project. I don't want it to be like, oh, you know, like I made my interest. So it sucks to be you that you didn't get any profits out of it. You know, like, okay. Question for you though. If you see that a project is not going as well as you expected, would you recommend them that maybe have your husband's renovation company to take over? Is that something that you guys would sort of like a contingency plan as a private lender? That's interesting because I've never invested close enough to here to do that. But I can tell you what I have done because I have had a situation where a project wasn't going very well. There was lots of delays going on and I did help them through the process. That being said, now again, to show you that it's not because I'm scared for me, and I'm just trying to help them out. I was in a first position mortgage. I was very uh, conservative because it was in the time of last year where things were going down. And I put myself in a place where I was in a good place. And I was like, if something happens, you know, my money is safe. Now, what happened with this person was they had problems with delays. They had delays with um permits they weren't expecting to need permits and then something happened for example knowing your neighbors is very important i bet you their problem was neighbors started to complain they didn't get the permits and then they complained to the city so now had to get the permits it's probably something along those lines that happened right mm -hmm. so they had a three-month delay this was supposed to be a six-month project um so they had a three-month delay on just getting started on the permits getting like put to in and then they were getting problems with their construction company that they use. Again, like things that you have to know about construction companies, not all of them work 100% of the time on your project. So that's like a question that you need to ask them. Are you fully dedicated to mine or is mine like three of the ones that are you're working, right? Because that can, as an investor, that's very important, right? Like as a homeowner, you can be like, oh, you know, my bathroom is going to take a month to get done. But yeah. for an investor, it's two weeks in and out, like get it done and it's done. Like we have deadlines to meet, right? Yep. For example, like it looked like the co the people they had were not working full time on the projects, right? So I did get involved in the sense of just helping him out through the process of like advising. At the permit side, there's nothing I could do. I mean, he learned his lesson, right? Like whatever happened, I don't know exactly what it was. There were delays with the permits, be it he didn't do it or, or just delays, nothing you can do about it, right? But it was, he was having problems with his contractors. So it's more of just like helping him, you know, be more firm with them and getting better deadlines or just even applying pressure. Sometimes, for example, like, this guy was a full-time, had a full-time job, right? So mm -hmm. he was, for example, this happens with a lot of people. Yep. They put a lot of confidence in their contractors to get things done and they don't monitor them, right? And some of them need to be held accountable. Others are self-starters. -starter Others are, they kind of work. If you, are, if you are rushed, they're rushed. If you're not rushed, they're not rushed, right? So I think that may have been one of the things like, a lot of contractors that aren't investor focused do not understand the urgency of getting projects done. They're used to the residential side where it's like you can get a bathroom done in a month. That is like unacceptable. 
Yeah. Why would it take a month to get a bathroom done? That's because they have other maybe five projects happening at the same time and they do two days yours, two days at another place, you know, something, whatever. However, they decide to structure things. Yeah. You also mentioned a good point that this contract already has a full-time job, right? So he's kind of, this is kind of like his side job. Like he's doing casually on the uh during the evening time or like during the weekends, right? So a lot of people actually end up the reason why people took their quotes is because their quote is actually relatively cheap, right? Yeah. So there's always a bit of trade-off, right? And that's why it's really important to do the due diligence on the contractor and figure out how to hold them accountable. And sometimes you even want to create a bit of a bonus or penalty systems for for the timeline so that they 100%. are motivated. Yeah, hundred percent agree because um. I feel like the two problems that I see is like that. And I've seen it actually happen many times. My poor husband has had to help some investors out because they don't learn their lesson even the second time. But what happens is new investors love to go for cheap. But yeah. the problem with cheap is you got to babysit. For example, we hire cheap, but that's because my husband's on site and we only need labor workers because we have our specialized people, right? Yeah. But for a new investor, this is not a good idea. Our people who are not working, who are not contractors, who are not there, let's say every day, you do not want to hire those kind of people. That being said, I'm not saying you have to hire incredibly expensive because expre incredibly expensive can be luxury home. And they may find, to be honest, your project very boring too. They may not even want to do it. So it's not about how expensive it is. It's about that you have someone can that they think for themselves and they can ask you questions to make sure that they're doing the project that they want for you. Like labor workers do not do that. You have to instruct them and tell them what to do. And if you're a new investor and you don't really know how you want your kitchen to be done and you want them to tell you, you can't go cheap because this is like you have to babysit those people. And when you're babysitting, it's like people like my husband, like contractors hire the labor workers, right? It's like the yeah. people that know what they're doing hire the labor workers because they know what they're doing. And they're the ones that are doing like the actual planning and organizing of things and telling the contractors do things. So if you're not planning to be that person, do not hire cheap. Yeah, the moment that you're hiring labor only, you kind of put yourself into a GC position or project manager position. And exactly. that requires a lot of experience and skill set. Like even right now, every time I, I get to Home Depot, I get overwhelmed right away because there's too many things, too many moving parts. And I knew that I'm never a good person to be in that GC position. That's why I partnered with my business partner, Andrew, who mm -hmm. enjoys doing that part, right? And even exactly. Scott, who enjoys doing that part. So yeah. that's awesome. Uh, Diana, I got a really important question for you. So for a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of investors thought about being a private lender as well. But sometimes when you're an equity partner, it shows that the, the margin, like on the percentage, right, the, the ROI can be a lot higher. What made you decide to go with a private lender? So I like private lending because I have control over it. So for example, and I have specific criteria. Right. So, for example, like I only do mortgages. Right. So I don't do, let's say, promissory notes. I only fully just do mortgages on the equity side. Really, you're only allowing and you're really just there along for the ride. You're only letting the people that actually are doing the projects do the work. So that you don't really have much say to it. I wanted to ask you a very important question. A lot of investors like us, sometimes we are more attracted to the equity partner, being the equity partner rather than being, being a private uh, lender. So what made you actually decide to go with a private lending route? I like the private lending route because I get to have control over the kind of deals I want. I get to dig into the numbers a lot. I feel like, for example, in things that I've seen for equity partners is very surface level information that you get. I am a person that loves to dig into the numbers and actually really see like I do with a private land, right? I'll be asking for proof of funds. I'll be asking for the strategies. Like I actually really Really look into things and you don't really get that i feel like the way it's looked at is more about you having trust in the person and not really being able to like see things you know they can inflate things if they want to say things that they want to and really you're going almost on a trust basis and i trust what i do i'm good at finding deals and and i think the reason why i'm good at that is because i can actually see things you know, I can actually get the numbers like the like I can get real numbers, like I can actually do the analysis of the deal and get the information I need to get the deal. Mm -hmm. So usually when you're doing the private lending, you're going
going to be the first, like the first mortgage position, I'm assuming, right? In these days, because of this economy, yeah, I'm usually in a first position. Back before when things were doing amazing, I was in second position mortgages, uh, first or second, but a lot more second just because of how good the economy was. And I had the confidence to do that. But these days, yeah, it's all first. I don't even think I have a single second, actually. Wow, nice. And then, uh, so basically, whoever that's trying to uh, qualify for for your application, they need to come up with a down payment plus a renovation funds. Okay, so yeah, being a first mortgage position, obviously, this is a, the most secure position that you can ever ask for. And if they default on any payments, then at least you, can, you also have an option to take over the project. And actually, to even say that, I can do, like, there's an actually a deal I'm looking at right now. I actually, I've, the, people have been getting really good deals lately, to be honest. So there's one I recently closed on a couple of weeks ago, and that one I paid 100% of the purchase price. That to the appraisal was around like 75 or 70% loan to value that they got. So they got a really good deal, probably even less to be honest. So for example, I actually did 100% of the purchase price. Another deal has come to me where I'm actually, they're doing a quick hotel deal. And if it ends up working out, I need to obviously get all the rest of the details, but we're doing, it's like a preliminary check, but it's looking really good so far. And I'm actually going to be paying for the first mortgage closing costs and the renovation costs. Wow. It's pretty much a hundred percent financing for the whole Almost, thing. Yeah. They're only taking care of the holding costs. I see. Wow. That's why I don't like the, it's like, it really depends on the deal. And some people are very good at negotiating prices and getting deals. And, you know, those are the kind of things that you, I like to be a part of, you know, people who are very creative and if they get a good deal, why not honor that and, and help out, you know? What's the percentage that you typically uh, give out? Do you typically uh, charge on the interest? Yeah. Side? So on first, it's usually between 10 and 12, usually more like 12 is when it's on a first and it's like around... 75% loan to value. Actually, either way, actually. If I'm doing, for example, like this specific deal that I was just saying that if it does end up panning through, that one's actually going to 15%. So that one's going higher. I see. And do you charge a lender's fee or on top of that? Yeah. So for example, this person, I am charging them a lender's fee because I've never worked with them. So I don't know how they work. And that's actually just how they initiated it. They initiated it with a lender's fee. Because most of the people that I lend to, I usually do higher interest, but then I don't do a lender fee. And it's usually because I work with them, I know them, and the deals are good. Right. Awesome. When did you start doing the private lending? Like probably uh, like when COVID started, like 2020. I see. And prior to that, you were kind of just uh, operating your own projects, right? Yeah, I was in the burrs and the flips before then. I see. Okay. So you're pretty much accumulating up capital by by the time uh, COVID hits. And then you're like, you know what? Market's good, right? I want it to be a little bit passive. Let's change it or adapt into a different strategy where I can just get my hands into multiple different projects while you still have the renovation company that's pulling the active income yeah no like we're still doing active projects and i don't think the number i think we've we actually increased the amount of projects getting into covid just the private lending side happened was kind of what you were saying it was more for the fact of one you get to see how people run their deals you get to learn their character so you get to learn like are they bold are they conservative like you get to really learn by talking to them and seeing how they run their numbers and you can also learn even different strategies like I've learned different types of deals actually from people giving me their deals so so I like the private lending side yes is passive and I like the passive because it gives me time to do my active stuff because I'm not one of those that can do 20 things at the same time I don't have that skill <laughs> so that's a lot that's the biggest reason why I got into the passive side because I can't invest all my money in my active projects because I'd probably go crazy but I also really love it was my way of learning from other people if I get to see how they run their projects same thing like a lot of them we become friends where I can even just ask them like how it went, how things, how they were, you know, like that I can get involved if they ask so about. I like that it's a different type of partnership. I can be involved in other projects. You can cherry pick the right ones. You know, you can be picky on the pat on the private side and just pick the really good deals and invest in those. Yeah. No, that that's awesome because you really get to know other people's mindset, how they operate and even their business model. Right. And you can even take it to the next level of you know what, I really like the kind of projects they do less JV afterwards, because now you've at least learned them. Like, I remember there was one person who wanted to JV with me. I'm like, let's do a couple private lens first. Treat me as a JV partner, though. Mm -hmm. And 
let's see how it goes, you know, and then there because there you get to learn, like, are they informing you enough? Do you feel comfortable throughout the process? Like, how does when things get tough, like, how do you guys both handle it? You know, like, like, are you both stressed with each other and stressing each other out? Or are we able to handle like fights and things will happen? But it's like, can you get through it? Right? And and get onto the other side? Or are we like, being blockers to each other or what, right? Yeah, yeah. there's always going to be a bit of a disagreement here and there. Uh, but the main thing is that you want to see whether or not this, uh, the partnership can actually get through the hard time. And exactly. it actually be better after these type of adjustment period. Exactly. Or you're willing to learn from your mistakes and figure out, okay, like how can we make this better? Like, it's just, you learn a lot from a project and it's like, why not do it through a private line first to just see how it is and be more involved in a private line. Cause like a lot of my private lines, I have no idea what goes on in the projects because it's just a pure private land. Right. And they don't need to tell me anything because I have no involvement. But the ones that do want to part do a partnership, then those are a bit different, right? Because they're like, then we're, they're treating me more like a partner and they're giving me updates and things so that I can actually see what's going on. That's very interesting. I've actually, you're the first person who can kind of, uh, who kind of use the private lending as a primary strategy on our show so far. I'm mm -hmm. sure we'll have more, but yeah, the mindset and uh, for the protection of your own capital seems to be very on point, right? Compared to all the other, because I feel like the it's all trade off, right? If you want to get into a, a JV position where you can potentially gain a little bit more, yeah, there's going to be more risk that you probably need to take up. And for you, it does sound like you're more concerned about the return of the capital rather than the on the capital, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really awesome. So is it fair to say that the platform that you're building right now is also allow you to get into more private lending opportunities with other operators or other investors? Oh yeah, just networking in general, right? Like meeting as many people as you can, getting to know people as much as you can, you know, like I feel like that, like a lot of us, you know, it's like having like, let's say a conversation with you and mean like, hey, what do you do? And really talking to you to get to know you, you know, like Instagram, Facebook, I feel like you don't really fully get to, like you see the advertisement you, not the who are you and like, what are your projects really like you, you know? Yeah. And here it's like, I, this is the purpose of this is like, who are you really? You know, like you'll probably get to see both sides because you have the forums in there, right? You can actually ask questions, get to know and get to not only just get to know each other, but get to know each other through forum questions. Like I have this problem. How do I solve it? Nice. That's awesome. Is there anything else that you're, so right now you're focused on this platform and you want to obviously grow this to be 2000 members. And this will essentially allow you to have access to even more projects. Is your position primary going to be the private lending moving forward or what's your, I guess, the main strategy uh, in the next, let's say three to five years? I mean, my main strategy, like I said, will always be private lending, but I can say now I've started to get back into looking into the active deals. I was a little bit in hibernation mode. I mean, this project was taking me time. I'm like, like I said, I'm a very focused person. So when I'm on something, I need, I put my 100% energy on it. And that was how it happened with this. I put all my energy into it. Now I feel like it's in a stable state. I have like everything in place where I don't have to put 100% of my energy into it because I have things in place, processes in place. So now I have started actually what's going on in the market, checking out what the next thing is, what kind of, for example, flips are there, like what cities to invest in, you know, even the property types, you could, I don't know if you've noticed, but even property types change, what, which ones are making the best money right now. So now I'm in a bit, bit of a research mode to actually find like that, like which areas are the best ones to invest in and how things are, just get a view of the economy at this point and, and just start now getting back into the flips and burrs again. Flips and burrs. And uh, do, you, do you mind sharing like what type of asset class that you're looking into right now? For flips and burrs, I mean, it will always be single fat, I guess like single family or multifamily. It's really, to be honest, value add is what I like. I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah I try to stay away from a single family because the moment that the ARV doesn't, we're unable to actually sell for the project that we want, right? There's not a lot of uh, exit strategy or contingency plan that we can put together. We still want to flip like anything to you or more uh two units is, is actually the best so far because it catches the investors 
it also catches the single family who want to have a bit, uh, let's say, have an option to actually rent out or Airbnb the, the, the basement or the, or additional units in the back. I wouldn't discount them though. Like that, I can tell you that the two deals, one that I for sure private lend to and the one I'm seeing right now, mm-hmm. both are single family homes. Specifically, the one that did lend to, can you imagine? This is going to be a flip. Whatever reason it doesn't get sold, they can actually burn it as a single family home and still cash flow. Very little, but cash flow. People don't even think that exists in Ontario. And this person was able to find that, right? So I feel like I put mine to like value add because that's what I really love. I feel like I don't discount things just because you just never know. You may miss a good deal that is, you know, you don't want to let go of. Like, or you don't pay attention to and you pass by and it could have been a good deal. Yeah, what city was that? Simcoe. Simcoe, nice. Okay, actually, one more question for you. So if anybody wanted to learn how to become a private lender, right, like you do, because again, it actually sounds like whatever you're doing, you get yourself into a project, value add project, and you can be completely passive, completely hands off, right? If anybody's interested in this idea and want to actually try to become a private lender, what would be your advice to them? Basically, how did you, how did you first start it? And, and if you were to do it over again, what would you do differently? I feel like to be honest, the way that things was really well like that, because like you said, like I specifically did private lending for specifically flips and burrs because I understood them and knew them very well. I feel like that is an easy way to private lend to because I have seen brokers do deals they and they give you deals. They're not that good. Some of them may be good. Some are not good. And really, you are the steward of your own money. So I feel like it is important to understand what it is that you're investing in. And if you're going to go active in any sense, like to me, active and passive should be hand in hand. I feel like in the pa- by the passive side, you can get to know more things that are going on. Like you see trends happening. I see trends happening with my private lending. Whereas like if I'm working on one deal, I'm not going to see anything but the, the one deal I'm working on. But because I have my private lens, it gives me the larger, bigger scope of what's happening because I'll see trends happening throughout the year. I feel like active investors should do it. If it's people that have that are just doing it to make extra money. I personally think go conservative and don't put yourself into risky situations where you could lose the money and just being smart about it because if you don't want to know about the projects, then do something that's not so risky so that at least long-term you're making your money. That's awesome. Okay, uh, is there anything else you want to add at the end? I guess it would just be that I hope you guys join ReFam, help support and be a part of the movement. It transforms the way that investing the investing industry is going to work because it's just providing so much more support than we have now so i hope that you guys all join that's awesome we'll put the link uh, down below so if anybody's interested in this platform make sure you uh click get to know the platform a little bit if anybody wants to reach out to you what would be the best way to reach out to you in social medias uh investor girl diana on facebook instagram linkedin either one send me a dm there awesome thank you so much yeah thanks for having me it was so much fun perfect awesome yeah that was good